Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Reggie Abier, an economics PhD student at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available, along with presentation slides, on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pesco from the University of Missouri, to introduce our speaker. Today, we kick off our winter-spring 2024 season with the Grand Rounds presentation by Lucy Popova, entitled Effects of Messages About Very Low Nicotine Cigarettes, Insights from Focus Groups, a Discrete Choice Experiment in a Randomized Clinical Trial. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Lucy Popova is an Associate Professor at the Georgia State University School of Public Health. Her research lies at the intersection of health communication and tobacco control, focusing on creating and evaluating effective messages that discourage use of different tobacco products. Her research has been funded by federal, NCI, NIDA, CDC, and FDA, and local agencies, Fulton County Board of Health and Foundations, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Two of her papers received Paper of the Year awards. She is the director of the GSU Postdoctoral Fellowship in Global Tobacco Research and a voting member of the FDA's Tobacco Products Scientific Advisory Committee. Our discussant today is Jamie Harvin Boyce from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Lucy Popova, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you, Michael. Let me share my screen. Can you see? Can you see it? Yes, we can. Perfect. So I will talk today about our research program on messages communicating about low nicotine reduction and very low nicotine cigarettes. Um, here's my disclosure. I've been funded by, as Michael mentioned, I don't have any industry funding and you can look at that later. I want to say huge thanks to my collaborators without whom this work would not have been possible. And the people indicated by STARS are the ones who created many of those slides in the first place and whose work I stole. Um, so thank you so much, D. Pei and Charity and Tansa at the University of South Carolina and Reed Reynolds at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. So I'll begin by talking about the nicotine regulation timeline. It's been an idea for quite some time that if we reduce nicotine, if we remove most of nicotine from cigarettes, they will not be addictive anymore. And this will bring a lot of good things. People will make it, it will be easier to quit. People will not get addicted who are experimenting and so on. And the first um, kind of big milestone in this timeline was a 1994 article by Benowitz and Hengingfeld discussing how if we limit the nicotine in cigarettes to about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 milligrams per cigarette, this will prevent addiction. So this set up the actual threshold. In 2009, as many of you know, the FDA received authority from the Congress to regulate tobacco products through Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. This gave the agency the authority to potentially implement this policy. Um, interestingly, the act explicitly prohibits reducing nicotine to zero, but FDA would still be able to reduce it to 0.4 milligrams because it's not zero. Um, there have been a lot of research and one of the most seminal articles and studies on that uh, was 2015 published by Donnie and his team showing that reducing nicotine, particularly to those very low levels, reduces nicotine, reduces cigarette consumption, dependency, cravings, and makes people more likely to make a quit attempt. Um, FDA, taken into consideration all this body of research, in 2017 announced comprehensive approach to nicotine regulation, stating that the agencies had now two primary goals, was one, 
reducing the addictiveness of combusted cigarettes, and another potentially looking into less harmful tobacco products that could play a role. So the idea is if we remove nicotine from cigarettes, would smokers get really angry? <laughs> and um, by having some lower harm alternatives that can still provide nicotine, that would be something that should go together as a policy. In 2018, FDA did actually issue an advance notice of proposed rulemaking saying they're looking into this um, tobacco product standard for nicotine. In uh, 2022, New Zealand um, was their then government passed legislation. And one of the pieces of that was that they will reduce nicotine in cigarettes starting in 2025. Unfortunately, as of the new government that just got recently elected just a few weeks ago announced that they will repeal this legislation and the public health groups in New Zealand are working hard to see if they can prevent that. So that's the New Zealand. And um, in 2022, FDA still announced plans to saying we're still moving forward with this. So we'll potentially might happen. But when it's going to happen, we don't know yet. The menthol rule, as you know, was supposed to come out in the end of this year, got pushed back. The reduced nicotine policy was supposed to be the next big thing after, but with menthol rule being pushed back, we don't have a clear idea when it's going to happen. In any case, this is kind of brief outline of what the how the policy making has been thinking about the policy making has been moving forward. And what my work has been doing, I have been focusing on how do we, if this policy <clears throat> does move forward, how do we communicate to the public about that? And there are a lot of misperceptions about the reduced nicotine cigarettes, about the policy. And the biggest one of them is by removing nicotine from cigarettes, are cigarettes going to be less harmful? A lot of people believe nicotine is the most harmful thing in cigarettes. That's what causes all the lung cancer and all the other diseases. And so if nicotine is removed, then of course, it makes sense that cigarettes will be less harmful. So that's the misperception that needs to be addressed. And our work, oops, there we go. So we've had the, this is the our one that's been funded by NCI and FDA. And we had a body, a research program where we, systematically developed and tested messages about the nicotine reduction policy and very low nicotine cigarettes. We started with focus groups, we did um, discrete choice experiment, and we followed the culmination was a randomized clinical trial. So all of those focused on reduction in cigarettes primarily. We also on the side had a, two studies where we looked at nicotine reduction in cigar products, primarily little cigars and cigarillos. Um, the FDA is interested to know whether, when this policy is uh, being put in place, if it should only include small uh, combusted cigarettes or other combusted tobacco products like little cigars and cigarillos, which would be otherwise very ready substitutes and potentially would reduce the population level benefit. So. Uh, and this work on little cigars and cigarillos have been led by Charity and Tansa. And this is her doctoral dissertation work. And um, I'm not going to present on it today, but I would encourage you to invite her here. She can uh, present this really groundbreaking research. So what I'll talk today about is those studies. And in all of those, we focus on the following populations of interest. Uh, current exclusive smokers, which is defined as people who have smoked 100 cigarettes in their lifetime and are currently smoking every day or someday. And they are not using e-cigarettes. They haven't used um, e-cigarettes in the last 30 days. Current dual users who were current being, they had to be current exclusive smokers and also have used e-cigarettes in the last 30 days. And we looked at young adult known smokers and former smokers. And uh, we wanted to see whether our messages might have unintended consequences on, for those groups, such as suddenly making those uh, products more appealing and young people wanting to use them or former smokers wanting to go back to smoking. So I will next then discuss each of those studies and I will pause after the first two studies for any questions. 
So the first one is the focus group study. And this is a, one of the publications that came out of that. In this study, we developed four types of messages. One of them was uh, risk messages. So we focused about how reduced nicotine cigarettes still have all the other harmful chemicals, even though nicotine is reduced, but it's, and they also still cause all the same diseases. So like the last image talks about how reduced nicotine cigarettes no longer have nicotine and they're no longer addictive and they, but they still have all the bad stuff and they no longer have like stress relief properties, for example. So this was risk messages. Another type was efficacy messages where we focused on communicating that this products will make it easier to quit. The cigarettes with reduced nicotine will be less addictive. It will be a good thing. You can quit more easily. Young people will not get addicted, so on. And then uh, once we actually started doing groups, we realized there was another very widespread misperception that people will smoke a lot more. So they would compensate. And this is a very common thing that people kind of make sense. It's like nicotine is reduced. To get the same amount of nicotine, you need to smoke more. Uh, studies do show that you, with such low level of nicotine, people do not smoke more because they try a little bit, but it's impossible to get enough nicotine. So all the clinical trials showed there was no compensation. So we created a message about that. And last, we looked at the message talking about, well, nicotine is reduced in cigarettes, but if you still need nicotine, you can get it from other alternative sources like NRT or e-cigarettes. And this is addressing this whole idea of how FDA positioned this policy originally as on one hand will reduce nicotine in cigarettes, on the other hand, there will be alternatives offered. So what did we find? For risk messages, we found that they were, they resonated well. People saw this and they were like, that's scary. That's like, you really understand what, what you smoke in there. Um, and they realized that by removing nicotine, it's the good stuff that's removed, but not the bad. So we, those messages were perceived as effective and clearly communicated our ideas. Efficacy messages um, also were perceived pretty, received pretty well. Um, they talked about how they, if this policy does come into effect, it will bring a lot of hope to people who are tr having trouble quitting cigarettes. Um, they were perceived a little less effective than risk messages because generally people kind of have this idea that you know you need those scary messages to be effective in the smoking related areas. And some people commented how there was a mismatch between message and text. We're talking about like, this is like less addictive, but they're still about cigarettes. And so like having a happy message about, have happy image. When we talk about cigarettes, they were like, mm, something doesn't match. For the compensation message, they like the message, but anytime you bring up a message and say, there was a study, they're like, give me more data. Tell me what study, how many people. Are those, is this a real person? <laughs> Maybe it's just an actor. Oh yeah, of course it's just an actor on the ad. Um, but um, overall the message, they understood the message and it seemed to work well to dispel this idea of that people would need to compensate. And then when we showed the alternatives, um, that one didn't, wasn't received so well. It, people said, this is paid for by e-cigarette folks. This is hypercritical. It's like, why are you trying to get me off one tobacco product, but onto another? And interestingly, for people who are already using e-cigarettes, so dual users, they would say they would switch anyways. So when even when we didn't show this message, we just showed them about like one of our risk messages. What they said is like, oh, if that happens, I'll just switch. So we're like, okay. So we put that, all of that information aside. So this is our findings from the qualitative stuff. Any questions before we move to the next? Thank you, Lucy. Um, first, I'll turn it over to our uh, discussant for any questions that she may have. Thank you so much. And Lucy, you might be um, going to come on to this in more detail, uh, in which case, just tell me. I'm going to get to that later, Jamie. But I was really curious about the thing around the alternatives and essentially what, what situation 
we've created for ourselves or already exists out there in terms of people's understanding of differential risks between nicotine products. I feel like it's, it's a slightly complex message. And I think I'm interested in any thoughts you have on how to tackle that. Um, yeah, and let's, let's her- tackle the alternatives because we, we deal with alternatives much in much greater detail in our last study in the randomized clinical trial. So let's go and talk about that once we have the full a research program done. And can I ask you one more question, Lucy, which is specific to the focus group stuff. Um, I don't know if you purposefully sampled on this or not, but it strikes me that there might be, because some of this is a little bit uh, complex, different understandings amongst different population groups of what we mean when we're describing, you know, reduced risk products or the role of nicotine, et cetera. And I'm wondering if that's something you took into account in your sampling or analyses, or if that's maybe an area for future research to see if not just groups stratified based on their experience of smoking and vaping, but different population characteristics react um, differently. So yeah, we actually did look at the groups for, um, because we originally planned this before COVID and we were planning on doing in-person groups. We had groups in Atlanta and San Francisco. So it was groups with different um, backgrounds, different environments of policy regulations, all of that. Uh, we didn't find much differences in terms of um, between the city, the two cities. Um, we did look at other kind of characteristics, like other like demographics or anything, but we didn't really see much. We did analyze separately for each group and we did see some big differences, particularly like, uh, especially related to um, e-cigarettes, related to people who have had experience with them versus not. And like former smokers really were the ones who didn't like anything about them particularly. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Jamie. Um, there's a few questions in the Q and A, uh, and just uh, would like to remind audience members to please submit your questions to the Q and A uh, feature, and we will uh, ask those to the presenter when we have a chance. Um, one question: uh, asking for some clarification. Uh, what about smokers who are mainly addicted to the behavioral aspect of smoking? That's a great question. We actually have a whole another paper from this focus groups comment on on that where it's loud at all. And we did ask them about like, what is it? What about nicotine? Why are you addicted? And they do have really clear. Um, it's a multidimensional view of addiction. It's not just nicotine. They do see like they talked about how they're addicted to the ritual or other things. And so for them, some of them said, well, removing nicotine by itself is not going to do that and it's it's not 100 percent. like yeah people would still be feeling addictive however if there is no nicotine and what the studies show of if there's no if 95 percent of, of nicotine is removed so there's still nic- nicotine in there um people do find it much easier to quit and easier to to like those who want to quit find it that this helps yeah thank you um, another um, uh, kind of clarification question here, I guess. Uh, I heard the suggestion that very low nicotine cigarettes could be combined with nicotine from NRTs. How is that supposed to to work? Um, <laughs> well, um, I haven't done studies like that, but I think the idea is really pe- for people. the The difficulty when somebody is quitting is the withdrawals, and so when switching to reduced nicotine triggers the same withdrawals. Um, maybe it's slightly less degree uh, and using nicotine replacement theory helps that by providing nicotine in a non-combustible form in a pharmaceutical form. Okay. Uh, uh, last question and then we'll move on. Uh, through what channels did you imagine these t- uh, uh, text test messages being distributed? How were they designed? They seem fairly complex for some types of media. Um, we, for this one, we just went with like print ads, like something that would be either like a poster or you could eventually adopt it for a social media post. We, for the future studies, we will be developing more like shorter uh, messages potentially could be used as inserts in the, inside the packs if that moves forward. Um, we can do videos. The, the format is like if, if the campaign goes forward, it the messages will be developed in any format. For our purpose of testing, usually just a print ads with full color is good. And we used a 
a research company and we collaborated with them and um, and worked with them to develop those messages. So professional designers. Okay. Great. Uh, please continue with your presentation. Excellent. All right. So let's now talk about the discrete choice experiment. So for those of you who might not be familiar with discrete choice experiments, it's an experiment, but it's where you show multiple things at a time and ask people to pick like the best or the worst or both. Normally, when you do an experiment, like randomized clinical trial, when you evaluate messages, you would randomize people to one message at a time. So if you wanted to evaluate, let's say, um, whether the source is the message comes from FDA or not, and whether it talks about 95% less nicotine versus not, you would need to create you know, two by two and uh, four conditions. And if you have more, then this number starts growing exponentially. When you have a discrete choice experiment, it allows you to simultaneously evaluate multiple attributes. So that's a good thing. In real experiment, when you show a message, you show them a message, you expose them, and then you can ask questions like, how harmful do you think these products are? And the response then when you compare them between the groups, you can make causal claims and say, okay, people see in this message, influences perception of harm if you find differences. With DC, unfortunately, you cannot do that because they're seeing all those messages and so their eventual perception of harm is going to be influenced by all of them. But what they can answer is their preference for messages or their perceptions to messages. So like, which message do you think most motivates you to quit? And they can answer that. So it focuses on perceptions of effectiveness rather than actual effectiveness. But DCEs have been used a lot, particularly in economic studies and tobacco companies themselves have used them a lot to argue their case. So it makes sense to, for us to also use this approach. So in our study, we use the following message. It's called message attributes. So we wanted to see, does it matter if there's a source information, whether it's message comes from FDA or by putting FDA logo. If there's information about chemicals, they still have harmful chemicals like formaldehyde and arsenic. Um, talking about same harm, they still cause lung cancer and death. Talking about specific nicotine reduction, because in some in past studies by Justin Byron, it's been shown that putting the number helps communicate about that. We did put information that they're less satisfying, because that's something that's not very, it's, it's different from everything else. And in our previous studies, where we ask question about support for the policy and what people would do when we framed it as like, this would be nicotine would, low nicotine cigarettes would no longer reduce your cravings or meaning they would be less satisfying. This was kind of the most impactful way of framing. Uh, we talked about addiction being reduced. They're now minimally non-addictive and quitting efficacy increased. So again, this is like one, two, three, four, five, seven of them. So if we were to do this, there would have been like many, many, many conditions. In, instead, we did the DC. So this is what it looked like. People would see, participants would see this four panels side by side. You would see in, in each one of them, they had those statements where they didn't have some of them. Sometimes they had FDA logo, sometimes not. And we asked, which message would most motivate you and which would least motivate you to quit smoking? People would select. Um, then we would also ask like, did it really make a difference or not? So we could eliminate people for whom it like didn't really matter. There's a lot of other nuances, lots of tweaks on how you analyze the data. Uh, but the outcomes we looked at were <clears throat> uh, emotions, which message made you feel most positive or negative about the policy, which one made you most or least think cigarettes are harmful, and the behavioral kind of related to behavioral intentions was for people who smoke, we asked which one would most motivate you to quit smoking? And for people who don't smoke, former smokers and non-smokers, which one would you most interest you in trying cigarettes? So here, like the, the opposite, we don't want them to be trying cigarettes. So here's what we found. And this is a lot of things, but I will go through and explain. Starting to, so now I'm going backwards, starting with the behavioral motivation. Pretty much any, so the bars, when they point, to the right where it says increased means this, including this message attribute, increased the likelihood of selecting this being the best or the most and going the other way decreased. So for people who smoke, pretty much any feature except the one that talked about addictiveness reduction 
they selected it as, yes, this motivates me to quit smoking, which is a good thing. We're like, okay, well, probably can use all of those things in our communications with smokers and that they see those as motivating to quit. For the next one, the behavioral motivation to try, this is among people who are not currently smoking. We don't want them to be motivated to try. So seeing this, that the, the green bar, which says addictiveness would be reduced and the red bar, which is um, making quitting easier, they actually viewing this as like, huh, because they're less harmful, maybe I should, I, this would be motivating to potentially try. However, including any harm information, you could see it's like the really big effect size going down and reducing any interest in, or being perceived as a reducing interest in trying. Uh, in terms of perceptions of harm, the, of course, information about the chemicals and the diseases had the biggest effects, but also simply uh, putting the satisfaction was reduced. You're like, okay, well, if satisfaction is reduced, therefore they're probably harmful. And interestingly, putting FDA logo <clears throat> is viewed as um, something harmful. And this is probably because um, your agencies often communicate those harmful information. So seeing it there, it's like, okay. However, when we ask about the attitudes about the policy, knowing that nicotine is reduced by 95% and the, making it easier to quit, addictiveness, this is the things that make it people feel positive about the policy. But having those harms make people feel negative. And that's kind of in line with what we know when people see something that evokes negative emotions, they, that spreads to other perceptions and judgments. So what did we, we concluded that Consistently, information about harms and chemicals is across all our outcomes produced large effects. And motivation to quit was potentially responsive to various messages, and those could be used simultaneously. And because the feelings about policy, which you know we would want people to feel positive about the policy, but including chemicals and that made them feel more negative. It seems like what we might need to do is separate communication about the policy. So when we talk about the policy, we should be like, this is making, the, so like do all this positive things, <laughs> but this is making the policies great, makes people easier to quit. And then when we talk about the cigarettes themselves, focusing really on the harm. So that's what we are seeing from here. So I'm going to pause again, and any questions on the discrete choice experiment specifically? Thank you. Uh, let's turn it over again to our discussant for any comments or questions. Thanks so much, Lucy. I Discrete choice experiments are something that I have so little knowledge on compared to other things, so it's great to see this. Um, I had a couple questions about it, which was one is, is there a way to look at interactions through this, right? Because we might not include all of these messages or attributes. Um, and is that something you guys looked at? Yes, this is actually, it's again, great questions. Um, this is something you need to plan ahead of time. And we did look at it um, the way we designed it because it's a very complex process and I, I just know enough to be dangerous. But the way you to put in, we actually wanted to see the interaction between the the efficacy messages because this is um, driven by theories like extended parallel process model that says when you have the threat and efficacy perceptions could interact. And so we we did include for that, but we tested and we didn't see any interactions in that. And there's also a possibility to test for interactions for uh, with demographic characteristics. And this is on our to do list. <laughs> Awesome. That'll be so interesting to see. Thank you. That's it for me on that part. Okay. Um, I think that there's a, a just kind of one one audience question, and I'll I'll uh, just just paraphrase. Um, uh, could, could you just kind of describe how your DCE is a similar or different to other DCEs out of the literature in terms of kind of operationalization? That's a not sure. I'm quite understand. I don't think I've seen too many DCEs specifically for. Um, reduce nicotine messages. Normally, there's been a lot of DCs that look at um, like warning labels on packs and they include different variations of la labels. They put in um, maybe brand name and different fonts. They put in prices and then they 
look at all the influence of those different message attributes. Ours, we specifically looked at um, the those different messages. And the way we operationalized was some in like if you're doing the if your price is your attribute, you would put different levels. What we did is like yes or no, like presence or absence. So like we had a FDA logo or we didn't. So that was different from how some other DCs would be done where there's different levels and the levels are, are shifted around. So hopefully that addresses that and I'm happy to talk more. And um, I don't know if you if you know this, but our um, our DC is commonly used to uh, evaluate other like changing other products, like maybe in the alcohol industry, for example, um, pharmaceutical industry. Um, like, how commonly are these DCUs used outside of tobacco? It's a great question. I am actually not too familiar with other literature in that field. I know I think um, I've seen some here and there. Um, Mike, would you know as an economist? <laughs> I feel like it's mostly in an economics field then. Uh, I, I'm not super, I, I'm not an expert, so I, I probably see, shouldn't. Maybe we can direct this uh, question at the end to see who's a great yeah, Maybe she'll weigh in. Piece. Right, right. That'd be interesting. <laughs> All right, go ahead and please uh, proceed with your presentation. All right. So next and the last study I'm going to talk about is the randomized clinical trial. So we did all this preliminary work. We developed the messages through focus groups testing. We tweaked things around. We tested the specific message attributes to understand um, the nuances of how each little piece of a message, how that is being perceived. And now we put it all together and wanted to test the actual effects of messages. Because in focus groups and in DCs, you don't really get that, what effect does message have? You can't really make causal claims. So we did, um, Randomized clinical trial uh, that was done this spring. Uh, we had uh, 1,900 participants and we randomized them to four conditions. So in this one, we didn't use former smokers because we wanted to increase the power for um, the people who smoke and we had doubled the number of exclusive smokers. And here, this is where we bring in back the messages about e-cigarettes. This is where we, the idea was really, let's show them messages about reduced nicotine. Let's show them messages about e-cigarettes. Let's show them this combination. And the idea was like, by showing this two messages about nicotine reduction and e-cigarettes being, for people who can't otherwise quit, potentially being um, a less harmful alternative to get nicotine, this would be like the best condition. So that's kind of what the FDA was framing that policy originally. Uh, and then we had the control message. A control message is we often do like something unrelated to tobacco. We often use bottled water ads. This is like the most neutral kind of simple thing. So we randomized, this was an online study. Participants, it was an Ipsos knowledge panel um, probability sample. We randomized them. They saw two, in each condition, they saw two, message, random, two messages randomly drawn from the pool of five messages. And the idea to do that when you do communication research, you don't want to just show do a whole study with just one message. Because if you find some effects, it's like, well, you found the effect of this type of, of this message. Can you generalize? No. So you always want to have multiple messages and just randomize people to them. And immediately after the exposure, we measured the primary outcome, which was perceived harm of reduced nicotine, the very low nicotine cigarettes. And then we measured a bunch of other perceptions, behavioral intentions, like do you intend to switch? Do you intend to quit? And then two weeks later, we followed up and we asked them again, the same perceived harm question. And then we asked them how like their smoking behavior, because we wanted, there's very few studies that do message testing and evaluate behavior as a result. So these are the messages we used in the study. The, based on our, what we learned from focus groups and the um, DCEs, we focused on really the messages, the images focused on the harm communicating how these cigarettes are still harmful. Um, nicotine is reduced, but all the other harmful chemicals remain and so on. So here's like a close up of like, here's like harmful chemicals, nicotine is taken out, but all of those are there. And each message did have text saying, cigarettes uh, with 95% less nicotine uh, will make it easier to quit. So we still had that kind of efficacy message and we had the FDA logo in all of them. Um, in the e-cigarette message condition, we used messages that we've tested in our past studies where we found that 
those uh, reduced perceived harm of e-cigarettes make smokers consider switching and they were not, we didn't find negative, um, like undesired outcomes in the past studies. Uh, and again, so in each condition, people saw two messages randomly drawn from this pool. Well, this is a close up of one of e-cigarette ones. And then in the combined condition, they saw one VLNC message and one e-cigarette message. And we saw showed VLNC always first in all the other ones, the order was randomized. So what did we find? Uh, we did find that our messages were effective in reducing perceived harm. Sorry, in reducing the misperception that VLNCs are less harmful than regular cigarettes. So in the control, if you see the control group, uh, a little less than a third believe that VLNCs are less harmful. And this is kind of a little lower, but comparable to what other studies have found where people generally believe that, yeah, if there's nicotine removal, products are going to be less harmful. And we found that showing messages, our messages, so VLNC condition or the combined condition, significantly reduced this perception. And so this is just the proportion, and we did the same results uh, with, we measured as an absolute perception and it was the same results. So people, so like cut in half the misperception that VLNCs are less harmful. However, this result was not long lived. When we measured the same thing two weeks later, we saw that um, in both conditions where it was lower, it went up and there were no significant differences at the two weeks measurement. So one short exposure doesn't really, you know, it changes perceptions immediately, but then people forget and comes back. So if we want something long lasting, we need repeated exposures. Um, we asked people, are you, do you think you will switch completely from cigarettes to e-cigarettes? Um, and what we found here is an interaction between smoking status, being an exclusive smoker versus dual user. And you can see here the first graph, <laughs> among people who exclusively smoke, there is no interest in switching to e-cigarettes. It's like, they're very, very little interest. Among people who dual use, so dual users, there is actually the highest intention is among in the group who just saw messages about VLNCs. We expected that showing them messages about e-cigarettes would be the highest, but it was it was not. So people for dual users, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it makes sense. They are already interested, they're already using e-cigarettes. And so just showing them the messages about the policy itself, they just make that conclusion and jump to it themselves. They're like, oh yeah, I'll just switch. And that's consistent with what we've seen with focus groups. Um, did we find anything with behavior? No. So we looked at different behavioral outcomes, but basically um, seeing this one message did not translate in any behavioral change, which is not surprising. So conclusions, we did find that our messages were effective in increasing perceived harm of valency and reducing the misperception, which is what we've been trying to do. And we did see that, so going back to that whole issue of dual focus of the policy on reducing nicotine and providing alternatives, is that adding those messages about e-cigarettes did not enhance the desired outcomes. So we set out with the hypothesis that this combined condition will be the most effective, and we didn't see that. Uh, and if anything, where we saw differences, it was mandual users for them switching was highest the intentions to switch were highest and just VLNC one where e-cigarettes were not mentioned. So it's like, well, more research is needed, but do we potentially, this might not be necessary to accompany this policy with all those messages about e-cigarettes. So this is it. And I'm ready for your questions. Great. Uh, thanks again, Lucy. Uh, but just as a reminder, please add your uh, questions to the Q&A panel. Uh, but we'll start um, with uh, any questions or comments uh, from the uh, the discuss them. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy. I've, it's just so interesting. Um, I have so many questions that I could ask and things to comment on, but I will start with some and then let other people ask questions. And then if there's more time, I might ask more. One of the questions I had when looking at those messages um, tested in the RCT, particularly around 
switching from smoking to vaping. Um, I just wrote down a quote from it. If you're a smoker and you're not ready for to quit for good, and then it was like, consider, you know, switching over to e-cigarettes. And I wondered about, I suppose, the provenance of that language. Like, where did you come up with that messaging? And the reason why I'm interested in this full disclosure is that in England, we would consider someone switching from smoking to vaping as someone who had quit smoking for good, right? So I'm interested in how that's positioned there as not a form of quitting smoking, even though someone might be completely not smoking anymore. Um, I think we, so we, those messages came from studies we've done back in 2016, 17. Um, and it was, again, a long, ex expansive process where we started with focus groups. Uh, we did do have different messages where we talked in different ways. And smokers, we've seen a lot of resistance to those messages. They're like, why are you trying to switch me to this product from one addiction to another? Why would I switch to something that I don't know the, like, that's not 100% safer and so a lot of stuff there. So like we eventually, based on this focus group's feedback and all that, we kind of like put in together the ideas and that's kind of like, so it was evidence-based. Um, I do think in the, the message is like, if you are not ready to quit, switch. The idea is like, if you're ready to quit, quit. We don't want to be like, you're ready to quit, switch. That's not a population level benefit. If people are ready to quit, they want to quit go get doctor, get therapy, get the NRT, try all of those things. If this doesn't work, or if you're actually not ready to quit yet, then switch. Interesting. Because I would think like there, at least, you know, I think there's a proportion of people who are ready to quit in that they want to quit smoking, let's say, but have tried all the other things and they haven't worked. And that's where like, I wonder how this messaging resonates, but that's, yeah. Very yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it gets like to like very long. <laughs> exactly. Like there's only so <laughs> much. Like, let's try and keep it simple. And that's kind of like if we worked in there. Yeah. But I think that's why this is just if there is a com communication campaign, messages like this will be part of it. Others would be much more extensive. Like I know like the work in uh, England that um, I think Severson published recently. No, Svensson um, at all where they did. Um, a longish, like two minute videos from experts. And that's mm -hmm. another form of communication and another message is where you can get in a lot more details and explaining all of that. Um, problem is like, would people sit there and listen, and watch that outside of the study? So that's, that's a whole another issue, but yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And then I was also really interested in that it seemed like the messages that were the most salient including amongst the dual users were around the harms right the kind of continued harms of smoking and I think often in this space or at least like one of the narratives that I come across is people being like well you can't possibly tell people that vaping is less harmful than smoking because then it might encourage other people to start vaping and who we wouldn't want vaping at all of this concern um but it's nice to see this in terms of the angle of actually it looks like just there's some space for just saying, you know, we might be talking about e-cigarettes, but let's actually focus on how harmful cigarettes are. And that message in itself is doing some of the work. And I would argue, like, maybe one of the downsides of e-cigarettes is that we've stopped talking about how harmful cigarettes themselves are in quite as much detail. Certainly not something that's uh, captured the public's imagination of late. So I just wondered if you had any comments or reflections on that. I have a paper on that. Um, I we were like thinking very uh, along similar lines uh, in that part of research following up those developing those messages we actually came up with two types of messages where one focus was more of kind of this positive e-cigarettes are good they're like less harmful but like really focusing on e-cigarettes and then we did uh, we call them like negative comparative risk messages where we focused on cigarettes and we're like cigarettes are really 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 bad and e-cigarettes are better so like but the the idea was the same thing about e-cigarettes, but the focus was different. And we found that both types of, so this was, um, uh, Bo Yang was the first author back in 2018 or 19. So it was comparative risk messages. Um, and we found like it was pretty similar uh, effects of both types of messages. The messages about cigarettes actually increased perceived like efficacy of quitting. So we're like, well, it's actually would be good. So yeah, I completely agree. We do need to comp continuously just hammer, keep hammering down the idea that cigarettes are so bad. Technically, yeah. anything else is better. So like, but really getting this perception of 
And that's how, you know, changing the perceived comparison risk is like, you don't necessarily need to bring the perceived risk of e-cigarettes down. If you bring up the perceived harm of cigarettes and really get it at, even though like when we measure it, it's like, oh, it's already high, but people don't really quite viscerally get that harm. Yeah, it's almost like not a salient for some reason. Yeah. I don't know if it's because it's been around for so long. Thank you so much. I will leave it to other people to ask questions. Um, but yeah, this has been fascinating. All right, thank you, Jamie. Um, first question, um, why did you choose to focus on e-cigarettes as the alternative versus tobacco-free nicotine pouches, for example? Was it because other products are less well-known? E-cigarettes are so stigmatized currently due to youth anti-vaping campaigns and value misperceptions. Well, this product, the project started back in like 2018. So at that time, there was no uh, nicotine pouches and that. And we, for messages focused, um, um, the messages we showed in the e-cigarette condition, we've tested them before. We've done a lot of work on developing them. So we knew they wouldn't have like this, any negative <laughs> undesired outcomes. Um, we, for other products, we, at the time of we developed the study, they were not as big. I think going now, uh, I think it's a great idea to test for um, pouches and just focus on that. I think a lot of it is they're less known. And um, when you do messages about them, might need to do a lot more explanation, whereas like for e-cigarettes, it's kind of like a known field now. Okay. Um, uh, did you question the smokers about their perceived harmfulness of e-cigarettes? Yes, we asked all of those questions and we don't remember right now. <laughs> um, but nor in the past studies, I know when we showed the e-cigarette messages, they the perceived harms were reduced. Um, yeah, those messages, those, the, the, we, we asked all sorts of questions. But I don't remember that, I don't think the VLNC messages had any effect on perceptions of harm of e-cigarettes. Yep. Is the real world application here solely for FDA endorsed messaging or more broadly public health messaging? I think the real world implication is if this policy, well, if when, hopefully, <laughs> when this policy moves forward, uh, we need to prepare and tobacco industry will work really hard not to, to, to block it. And so the support for policy is already high. There's a lot of studies showing that people think it's a good policy, but we do need, there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of, um, and just lack of knowledge. So in our study, when we asked like for almost every question we asked, the option was to say, don't know. And those numbers were kind of high. There were like, some questions were like 20% didn't know like if the VLNCs are less harmful or not. And so there's a lot of opportunities for educating people ahead of, the policy. And so what we are arguing is that based on our evidence is that developing a policy and moving forward with a policy should be accompanied by a communication campaign talking about how this cigarette, like explaining why this is happening, saying how it's, it's not the industry, it's the FDA is doing this, nicotine reduced will make it easier to quit, will be a good thing, will prevent people from becoming addicted, but the cigarettes are still very harmful. So make sure you quit. There's all these resources and making sure we have all those resources available when this policy happens. So really increasing the quit lines, increasing like all those things, um, cause it'll be really a game changer. And then talking about, so correcting misperceptions about them being less harmful. And the part where we still see in like, uh, based on our studies, we talking about e-cigarettes, didn't really do anything good, didn't do bad, but um, maybe talking about other products, maybe really emphasizing on the um, nicotine replacement therapy or anything else, or maybe not. So like, I think a little bit more research is needed to more definitively say, do we need messages about alternatives? And maybe not, maybe people will figure out their own alternatives and those who are already using or open to them, just going to go there, whereas others would be, you know, this is my moment to quit. I will quit and empowering them to do that. Okay. Uh, are you important to look at differences by race or gender? Um, I feel like we haven't done that yet. We are, <laughs> we, we just wrote like the main paper. Uh, we are controlling for that. They were, you know, random. Uh, we, this is, oh, yeah, this is something we'll, we'll be doing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you 
do you have a you you mentioned that people thought your nicotine alternative message might be from industry. Do you have any thoughts on how to increase message credibility? Well, in this one, we didn't put like FDA logo in there. Um, in general, people just really anti messages promote. Like people who are not using e cigarettes are very skeptical about messages that tell them to do it. So it's um, and we've seen that in many studies, and I, that's why I'm saying like. Maybe we don't even try that or doing it in such a way that's really just like focusing on the information and really talking about how like this is the science. Like I think they people do know then we hear people talking about, oh, I need to do my research and making those studies available. Um, I think it's up to us to, um, you know, write in such a language that is understandable to people. So if even if we're publishing an open access, somebody gets to our paper and tries to read it and it's in such a scientific jargon, it's really hard to understand. So <laughs> that might be not. But uh, people do read such, read studies and so writing them, talking about how what we found, educating people. Do you, so just out of curiosity, for uh, countries that have tried to use that kind of messaging, has there been um, can you observe that kind of apprehension, like among the public at large? And for example, New New Zealand, I think, tried to message positively about switching to e-cigarettes. Is is it has have people surveyed the uh, the people in New New Zealand to kind of uh, figure out how they're feeling about this message? And does it correspond with what you're observing in in the focus groups? Yeah. That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. I haven't seen studies that actually reported on that, but there might have been some. If anybody here is from uh, familiar with that research, if, or not just New Zealand, the UK would be mm -hmm. more of a example where they did that messaging. So, Jamie, <laughs> you work. Right. Um, I think I'm not aware of that research. I suspect it's been done. But I think what we've experienced in the UK is despite, I think, year on year trying to put out more and more messaging from our various public health agencies about the relative risks and, and harms of e-cigarettes compared to smoking and, and trying to encourage people who smoke to switch to e-cigarettes. Year on year, pretty much with a few minor blips, more and more people think that e-cigarettes are as harmful or more harmful than traditional cigarettes. So the public health messaging in that regard, I'm not sure it's achieving the aims it's set out to do. I don't know if it's contributing to that. I suspect it probably isn't and that it's more news coverage and things like that. But certainly it seems really hard to overcome the reticence around use of e-cigarettes, even in a context where they are being actively encouraged by a public health agency. Thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, so there's two questions about um, illegal markets, and um, if you're if you have any thoughts on 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 that based on um, what you might expect if the the low nicotine standard like went into effect, did you consider illegal markets? And then somebody was in particular um, wondering about the possibility of people adding uh, external nicotine to very low nicotine cigarettes. These are great questions, and there's research and publications focusing on both of them just um this is not my exact area but um for illegal markets this is a very commonly used tobacco industry argument saying like anytime you do a policy you're always going to blow up illegal markets um and the way illegal markets work where do, where do stuff from illegal markets come from well it's from the same tobacco companies if they had a desire to not sell their own products and reroute it back to illegal market we wouldn't have a legal market um so obviously there's it's a concern. The research shows um, both there's been studies that look at people's willingness to buy it on illegal market. If the policy comes in place, it's pretty low. Um, and um, we don't have the real world situation yet where we can see. But in general, like what we've seen was illegal was like policies. Generally, illegal markets are not as big of a issue as we talk about them beforehand. Uh, but again, refer to, there's a lot of research, Kurt Ribosol's work on that area that they published a lot. Um, and then the other one was, which one was that? So markets uh, and- uh, adding, adding external adding, nicotine, okay. I um, guess, right. <laughs> Early on, I looked in, um, um, like on Reddit and I'm like, is anybody doing this? 
And some people had the same questions, like, can you add e-juice to cigarettes? And people are like, it tastes horrible. So at least of, I don't think it's as easily done and something where, I mean, it's certainly something people could do, but in general, people are kind of lazy. You don't see people adding flavors to cigarettes to get back, you know, the clove flavor or whatever. <laughs> Once we got rid of flavors, we don't have flavored cigarettes in our country anymore. Um, and people just either use non-flavored ones or they will use non uh, the ones with reduced nicotine or it's it's again it might be happening but it's not i don't think it's going to happen on such a large scale okay um is it possible that some of the resistance to trying uh e-cigarettes is due to the amount of misinformation that people who smoke have heard um i am sure, sure there's a lot of different reasons why people um see it i don't think it's you know, some of it is misinformation, some of it is information. New research comes up again and again where it's like e-cigarettes do have harmful negative effects. And what we've seen a lot is not just, the resistance was not because like, oh, I think they're really harmful. It's more like, I am not willing to switch unless it's 100% safe. So it's really like when we, they, they understand they're less harmful, but they're like, well, but how much less? It's like, so they're really, they like smoking. They don't want to change their behavior. And so when tell them like, this is a less harmful product, they're like, well, what is it? hundred percent. I'm not going to do it till it's hundred percent. And then it's like, there's other reason and they would engage in. So it's not necessarily that they're like, oh, it's equally harmful. It's more like, I know it's less harmful. It's just, I just don't want it. All right. Uh, I think that that uh, uh, wraps us up here. I'm going to send it back over to our MC to take us out the door. Thanks again for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Popova, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave this webinar open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is bit.ly slash tops meeting, all lowercase. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 150 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend.